In Oakland, California, mourning continues over the death of at least 36 people who were killed in a fire at the Ghost Ship Warehouse one week ago. The fire is one of the deadliest building fires in the last half-century in the United States. The Ghost Ship was an artist collective that housed many young artists and musicians, and the victims were overwhelmingly young artists, activists and community organizers. This is Oakland resident Amir. Obviously, I'm sad. Um, I knew two people in the fire named Alex and Anna. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm sad, but I'm, I'm more concerned about their, their family and their well-being. More than that, I've lost two friends. The ghost ship warehouse was reportedly rife with fire hazards. Its landlord had a history of owning properties with building violations. Many local Oakland artists and tenants' rights activists say the fire is a symptom of a failed urban housing policy, where rising rents have forced people to live and make art in sometimes hazardous spaces. In the wake of the fire, Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff has pledged $1.7 million to create and sustain affordable, safe spaces for local artists and arts organizations. For more, we go directly to Oakland, California, where we're joined by Nihar Bhatt, a Bay Area DJ, record label owner, who survived the ghost ship warehouse fire. Seven of his friends died that night. Nihar, welcome to Democracy Now!, our deepest condolences for your loss. Can you describe what happened that night? Sure. Thank you very much, Amy, for having me on. Um, the the night of the fire, which was this last Friday, um, uh, I can't believe it's only been a week. It feels like a lifetime. Uh, I was going to uh, the event um, and go to the event to support a number of friends that were um, that were performing that night uh, and. Um, I actually got out of a car, walked over to the to the uh, building where the event was happening. I was out, out front. I saw a couple of my friends, um, and I started chatting with them. There was, uh, you know, it was two friends in particular. One of them went inside midway through our conversation. A couple minutes later, um, he never came out of the building. Uh, the other friend that I was chatting with, we hung back, chatted for a little bit. Um, and then suddenly we heard the word fire. Um, we, you know, looked over, you know, and and in horror, people started pouring out. Um, we couldn't believe what we heard. You know, we immediately thought, what can we do? And we were sort of still, you know, about. We were about to enter the building, and we we wanted to know what we could do. We were before we could even formulate our thoughts on that question. The uh, the entire building filled up with. You know, just plumes of, of smoke starting to waft out of the of the building, um, and we realized there was no way we could enter. We had no idea what was going on. Um, we waited outside of the building for hours, um, you know, realizing that no one was coming out. You know, we spent a lot of time just, you know, I I, I just imagine was just just dreaming of of our friends. Uh, emerging, you know, in some way, something ha happening. But the fact is, the building was—it was not possible to enter the building very quickly. This entire incident happened so much more quickly than anyone could have imagined. You don't—you know, I don't think any of us, uh, you know, could have imagined a fire taking, uh, taking and completely consuming a, a building as quickly as it did. And really, the smoke is something that none of us—none of us could have anticipated it would have been that deadly that quickly. Um, so, um, you know, we, we watched it happen and waited outside, realizing that a lot of people we knew, in my case, seven people I, I knew well, people that were really important to me, um, were inside and, uh, you know, important to me for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, basically, I, you know, we, we waited and, waited to hear, to see if there was something we didn't know. Um, but the the simple truth was that they were, they were never coming out. Mm. Um, can yeah. you, Nihar, can you describe the ghost ship, um, what this space represents for the community, for artists? Uh, sure. Uh, the ghost ship is just one of the few places left where the community could well, for my community, it was one of the few, which is a sort of um, sort of underground techno and house uh, and experimental electronic 
music scene. Um, it was one of the few places that was open to us to do events, to events that had a long timeline that could go very late into the night. Um, it was a community, it was a, it was a space where we could go outside of the typical bar and club scene um, that that type of event sort of usually often takes place in, um, which is which is really important because um, you know in in you know bars and clubs the imperative is to sell alcohol to um, and that's you know whether whether are good people working in the in a bar or a club or not the reality is you know what what you have to do is um, is sell as, as many drinks as possible. And that creates a certain dynamic around a space. Um, you know, it means that the people that are able to, to shape events in that space are the people with the biggest pockets. Um, and, you know, at a space like the ghost ship, um, you know, and why and they spaces, call it the ghost ship? Um, uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure why that, where that name came from. Uh, one thing about the space is that it was, you know, it was a space that our community rented um, for for events. We weren't, you know, most of the people, the people that lived there, weren't really involved in the organization of that event. That event, but there was some art that was sort of uh, that that sort of was reminiscent of that feel. There was a large ship at one point suspended in the in the space, and I think that that, that was part of the aesthetic. Um, well, but, um, several but. residents and friends say the fire highlighted the long-standing issue of the lack of affordable properties in the Bay Area. This is Berkeley Mayor Jesse Aragon. Really, this is a symptom of a, the broader housing gentrification crisis that's affecting the entire Bay Area, where artists are being pushed out of cities and pushed into, oftentimes, you know, dangerous situations. And we need to do more to create more uh, affordable and safe space for artists to live and work in our community. Nihabat, your response? Yes, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know what we've seen. You know, I mean, in Oakland in general, you know, the, the Bay Area, there have been you know thousands of evictions a year. Um, the uh, the escalation, the the scale of the housing crisis, is something that. You know, is is well known worldwide um, in, in the Bay Area, and that you know what what has become you know epidemic in San Francisco has bled into Oakland in in a really dramatic way. That's that's something that affects you know all you know all kinds of people um, within the artist community and within the, the the in the case of sort of work live spaces for artists. You see you know um, you see this. Pretty dram very dramatically, you know. We um, there are so many spaces that have been evicted and um, evicted in the last few years. Um, the you know Lobot Gallery in Oakland, 1919 Market Street in Oakland, um, are are just two of the spaces that were lost in in recent times. Um, and uh, you know that that's it's 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 just one symptom of it, but it it has an effect on all kinds of. All kinds of things. In in our in this case, you know, it, it had it drove people into a space that I think had a lot of was was a compromise. I think a lot of a lot of people were uh, were uh, conscious that it was not the the safest place because of some some specific factors about it. Um, nobody understood the scale of how safe how unsafe it would end up being. Nobody really. I don't think anyone could really have predicted how bad. Um, this tragedy would be, but it is it is the case that sort of the reason why people were driven to both live and then throw events in the space, um, and the majority of people who who perished didn't live there; they were just attending the an event there. Um, you know, the majority of people, and the reason why why people why this space became central was because of the dwindling effect of, and the, uh, the lack of alternatives. And uh, Nihar, um, um, Mayor Libby Schaff has pledged $1.7 million to create and sustain um, so-called affordable safe spaces for um, artists. Is this enough? Uh, she was shouted down at a vigil for warehouse fire victims. What mm -hmm. do you think she should be doing? I, th I think there you know that is not nearly enough. First of all, this initiative is one that was already in the works before the fire. It's not. It's not a response to the fire, but it's it's been uh, announced since then. Uh, you know, as part of Libby Schaff's at attempt 
at, at claiming that there is no witch hunt or, or overreaction to the fire. But the reality is, right now, you know, multiple warehouse spaces have already been served eviction notice within Oakland. We right now, you know, in the last couple of days since the the fire, um, many others have been served uh, served inspection notices. Inspection notices, you know, 1919 Market Day was an inspection notice that led to their to their eviction. And the you know the the reality is there needs to be much greater action, much more swift action. There's you know the right now what we what we really need is you know a moratorium on evictions. Um, you know, a moratorium on red tagging of buildings, uh, things that things that will affect all of the people being being evicted because the you know the what's happened after this disaster has been you know I think a, a, another example of disaster capitalism, a, a, a situation where you know landlords, developers, and other people that actually can profit quite a bit from you know from closing up and rebooting these spaces. Are jumping on this and taking taking advantage of it to colonize even more space within the East Bay, and I see, you know, I think that uh, that dynamic is unfolding immediately, and it requires immediate action. Sort of this promised budget in the future is not enough. Um, furthermore, there there needs to be, you know, uh, there needs to be funding for not just live workspaces, which is a extremely is an extremely essential piece of this, but also also venues for for this specific type of art. You know, late night the the late night dance music that was played there needs a space to 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 unfold uh, to to actually you know realize its its own its own purpose, which is which is to actually have these long late night events. Nihar, um, who owns uh -huh. the who owns the building? The um, the the building itself is owned by uh, some absentee landlords. Um, uh, you know their their names escape me right now, but the the building was administered in large part by the master tenant um, at the time. Mm. So. And on Wednesday, Oakland's alternative weekly, the East Bay Express, published yeah. an article in which fire department whistleblowers uh, blamed the tragedy on a poorly managed fire department. The article yeah. reads, several Oakland fire department employees looked up warehouse's fire code inspection history, but when they attempted to pull records for 1315 31st Avenue from their own Fire Prevention Bureau's files, they discovered nothing. It's not even in the system, one firefighter said. Um, he asked not to be identified for fear of retaliation from the city for speaking out. He and other firefighters went on to say the department's building inspection program is, quote, dangerously understaffed and disorganized. Again, that from the Oakland— um, East Bay Express. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. I think that the priorities of the city, you know, have not been with safety, have not been with fire safety. And you see, you know, there were only six building inspectors in Oakland. They hadn't been inside of this building for years and years and years. And um, the, you know, I think, you know, that that mismanagement and that that negligence, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that sort of trying to shift blame to the renters or the organizers of this event for this incident. But the reality is, there is, you know, not only is the is the Oakland Fire Department very, um, you know, very understaffed and under-resourced um, and, and mismanaged, it seems, too, but also there is a tremendous incentive within the city to not report the space that you work. And the reality is, the people with the biggest interest in defending ourselves and protecting our, ourselves from further tragedy of making these safe spaces are the people who live in these spaces, the people who throw events in these spaces, the people who attend these spaces. But right now, if you report a space, you might be homeless. You might be out of—or you might be out of a, a space to, to have special events. So until there's a, a, there's a clear and, and non-punitive path to people uh, coming into compliance, um, coming into compliance to people being able to throw events, uh, you know, in the way that they need—they want to and need to. Um, there will 
I think people will continue to operate in secrecy like this. Mm. So it's a double, you know, it's it's part of a, a larger systemic problem. I want um, I wanted to ask you about the transgender people who died in the fire, including Cash Askew from the band Them or Us Too. Um, a number of transgendered people dying in the fire. Since then, multiple media outlets have misgendered them, adding to the grief of the community. Can you talk about this, Nihar? Yeah, I think I think it's it's. You know, Cash Askew is somebody who um, struggled a lot within the music scene to, for, um, you know, to be treated equally and to be, you know, to be recognized the way that she wanted to be. And, uh, the you know, the misgendering of of her and, um, and Feral Pines uh, and, uh, and anyone else, you know, uh, any other transgender victims or, or people associated with this just adds further insult to to what has already been a horrible tragedy. Um, you know, these people struggled their whole lives for recognition to to be understood as their true selves, and their uh, and it's you know the it, it's the least that we can ask that the uh, that out of pay, pay, when paying respect to them that the media you know recognizes them for the for the in the way that they wanted to be recognized. In, in their lives, um, and you know, furthermore, you know, I think it's important to say that one of the reasons why there were, there were so many, you know, transgender people at this at this event, as well as uh, you know, you know, queer attendee, other queer attendees, and uh, and people of color who were victims of this fire, is because of the type of space, the type of opportunity a space like this presents. You know, the in the mainstream sort of. Club environment, bar environment, where you know where alcohol reigns supreme, where you know there's a, a different kind of environment. Often, I think people, you know, marginalized communities can face harassment. Can it doesn't feel like a safe space for them for a completely different set of reasons. And so, in a space like this, you know, communities can self-organize and and essentially be part of it in a different way, being included. And within Oakland, there is a very strong scene of of queer, transgender um, artists, you know, especially experimental artists um, within the electronic music scene in particular, and you know, as well as black and brown artists that are, you know, I think that are a really important key part of the uh, of, of the city's scene. Um, and Nihar. And there, I I, I just wanted to say that we've heard of a number of spaces from Baltimore to Nashville to other cities being closed down. And we just got this email from a listener who wrote, quote, here in Denver, our beloved artist spaces, Rhinoceropolis and Glob, were shut down last night by authorities. They'd been hosting events for independent experimental artists for over 10 years. They passed their annual inspection and were up to code with the city and their landlord, the email said. Uh, it went on to say the community was in mourning. Now many are without a home and without the spaces they pour their hearts and souls into. These are spaces radically tolerant for self-expression. We're all very sad, unquote. As we wrap up, Nihar, your thoughts about safe and unsafe spaces and what to do? Yeah, I think, uh, I think what we see right, right now is, is that the um, what we see right now is that across the country, like you said, Amy, you know, landlords are used either out of fear or, you know, out of the opportunity that this presents for them, shutting down spaces, you know, and, you know, the city in many cases are collaborating with them. Um, but I think that this will only make the problem worse. By punishing these spaces, we are creating con conditions for people to live in even more, more dangerous places, as well as, as throw events at e even more dangerous spaces. We need to, the city needs to, to fund and protect people that are right now under attack from eviction, from being being from being thrown out of these these spaces, uh, and they also need to fund the arts. They need to find spaces for people to to throw late night uh, late night electronic music parties as well as as a way you know because we people often think of this you know funding for the arts, support for the arts, places for artists to live and 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 do their work as you know, as something extra, something beyond the bread and butter issues. But I think we've seen through this this event that this is a matter of life and death. The you know we need we need safe spaces to be able to come into the light and to stop treating artists like criminals. Um, 
you know, any kind of artist, people who are, whether you're throwing, you know, throwing a dance party or, you know, or organizing a, a work-live space. Nihar, you know, we're, we're going to have to leave. Themselves. We have to leave it there, but I thank you so sure. much for spending this time. Bay Area DJ, record label owner who survived the ghost ship warehouse fire. Seven of Nihar's friends died in the ghost ship fire. Um, and again,